Ready. Hey. Just in the middle of the field, 45, 50. Green grass in front of him, leaving Lions in his way. I am Jeff Joniak. Blitz is on. <laughs> Down he goes. Oscar. What was it like playing for Coach Dicko? Uh, I don't want to answer any questions like that. 61 yards. A Sunday stroll for Justin Fields. Oh, no way. And Pekara is Pekara is Pekara. Now, Bears Etc. with the voices of the Chicago Bears, Jeff Joniak and Tom Thayer. You know, in most cases, when a team is minus five turnover ratio, the chances of winning are pretty slim. In fact, uh, it happened to the Bears Sunday in New Orleans, and somehow they managed to stay close and finish a one-score game. 24-17, the loss, moving the Bears to 2-7, and seven, but a real good effort by the defense to give the Bears a chance. Hi, everybody. Jeff Joniak, along with Super Bowl-winning Bears guard Tom Thayer. And this is Episode 31 of the Bears Etc. Podcast. Good to be with you each Tuesday and Thursday of the regular season. Coming up, our conversation with Bears head coach Matt Eberflus will review this thing. Short week, a lot of details to get through before Thursday night's primetime arrival of the Carolina Panthers. And a, a lot of time to sort out from the game of the Superdome. Uh, I kind of like to carve it up. The first three quarters of Tyson Bajan of the offense, and then the, that fateful uh, fourth quarter. That really was the difference right there. Yeah, but I think they've got to learn something from that fourth quarter, Jeff, because you talk about them, even though they had five turnovers, they had 71 yards and penalties, they were still in it at the end. But they have to figure out a way as a team how to capitalize on the opportunity at the end of the game because it was winnable for them. And you imagine the psychological pump they would have had if they would have made some mistakes but still came out with a win in one of the most hostile environments in the NFL. So I think it can be a learning experience, but they have to start maturing as a team and understand if they do make some mistakes, they're still good enough to win a game. You know, it it would remind you of the 91 game you won there in New Orleans, right? Exactly. And that's the thing about it is is we really didn't know what to think about uh, um, that game after we were leaving the stadium. But I think in the, the modern day football, you know, given the fact that how long and how many years have separated those two types of games, when we sat up in the booth, as much as we thought the booth was the game was getting away from the Bears, it never was. No. And they were making plays when they needed to make them the most. Uh, their field goal kicker happened to hit the upright when the Bears needed them to do that. But again, it's about the Bears capitalizing on extended opportunities that they were giving to still go out there and steal a game on the road that um, maybe not a lot of people thought they could. But somehow uh, the pressure's got to start getting better. And maybe with Montez Sweat, you know, he got his feet, more than his feet wet. He had 42 snaps, I think 25 pass rushing snaps. He was credited with four quarterback pressures, hit the hand of Derek Carr, caused the ball to go flittering down to the ground. But, you know, we heard from Andrew Billings today. We'll hear a little piece of that. He thought that it allowed guys to get singles. But, I, you know, I didn't see a lot of double teams of sweat just yet. Uh, Maybe there was some chipping going on for sure. But I think as a group they feel he will benefit them because even Billings said, hey, this is a legit dude, pass rusher, run defender. Yeah, it was great. Uh, I think he he did great. He went out there and we communicated, you know, it's – He's just got here, so it's a lot he has to catch up on. But I think we communicated. We got everything settled before the snap, and I think he fits right in. Yeah. What are some of the things about Sweat and his gameplay that impress you? Uh, he, I think he, he, he made it available for everybody to get one-on-ones. I think now we have a full threat on this line, and it's, it's really going to help out as far as offensive linemen, just not focusing on one player You know, each snap. They, they, have, to, they have to spread out the, the work. Well, as much as Montez Sweat did allow them to get some singles, I think creativity on the defensive line of scrimmage gave them the opportunity to get some singles because there's times at the game that uh, T.J. Edwards and Jack Sanborn lined up on the line of scrimmage, and all of a sudden they become responsibility of the defensive lineman, or else you have a guy like Kyler Gordon lining up at the linebacker level who was bringing some pressure and then had to, you know, take uh, one of the responsibilities of the blockers at the line of scrimmage. So I, I like the creativity of the defensive scheming that Eberflus put into place. But if you combine the two, com- combine the two of Montez Sweat getting some 
real pressure on the opponent, a little bit more concern about where he's lining up, and then some creativity about where they're positioning the linebackers. I think all those put together are going to be able to create some pressure in the future. I also like uh, the way Justin Jones played, honestly. Uh, I thought he was pretty violent in getting uh, his way in the run game a little bit and also getting a little pressure in there. I think um, maybe that snap rotation will help all those guys, but and then using Demarcus Walker inside, I think eventually you keep pounding this stone, it's going to break. I, 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 you know, Demarcus Walker coming off a career year last year. These guys just getting to know each other here are the final eight games. Maybe they can start to feel and getting Pickens and getting Dexter more snaps. I think they had fourteen and eleven respectively yesterday. That's a topic today as well up here at Hallis Hall, trying to get those guys more into the rotation and more snaps. I mean, there's plenty of different variety to choose from there. Well, you know what I think too, Jeff, is you have to have a certain amount of reps to see what combinations work the best. Is it Demarcus Walker and Mar- Montez Sweat? And is it Yannick Ngakwe and Justin Jones? Then how do you put in Andrew Billings and how do you put in the young guys? I think when these guys get some practice reps going, then you're going to kind of figure out how they best fit together and who complements each other the best. Bears fans, you can be there for live NFL action all season long as the official ticket marketplace for the bears and the nfl ticketmaster has a wide selection of tickets available for every game find tickets today at ticketmaster.com slash bears this is the bears etc podcast with tom Thayer, jeff joniak a couple of notes from today's news conference and again it's a short week so team meetings are going on right now walkthroughs and all that uh the right thumb of uh, justin Fields, still the biggest question mark of the week it seems like uh it is a day-to-day that's the official word from coach eberflus and uh limited so they're going to stick with that until Wednesday when we'll learn more. Hey, I'm not telling anybody anything until <laughs> I have to. And then I'm going to be very suspicious about the information that I let out there because I'm not going to sit there and, okay, a defensive coordinator of Carolina Panthers, get ready for the athleticism of Justin Fields or get ready for the youth of Tyson Bajan. So I'm not giving anybody any clues about anything. So you're going to have to live with it, and you're going to have to expect the unexpected come Thursday. Gary Blasting game will not be able to play. I know that that uh, is a shot for you to the offense for sure. Concussion, so he won't be able to go. Yeah, I, he's one of my favorite players, and I'm a big fan of fullbacks involved in um, uh, um, assignment attacking, point of attack type of football. I think Deontay Foreman and every one of the running backs, uh, Darrington Evans and Roshan Johnson and Khalil Herbert, for that matter, they're all complimented when they have a fullback in front of them. Jaquan Brisker on his way back. He, he should be able to play. Tremaine Edmonds, that's day-to-day with the knee as well. And there is still possibility of some guys coming off the injured reserve, that window starting to get closer for guys like Khalil Herbert, also Equimeneus St. Brown, and also uh, Blackwell uh, as well. The, you, you know, Really, he's the backup nickel. So they're, they're down uh, the road here with some of these guys that have played that nickel position this year. Uh, but he was uh, an outstanding special teams player, and he could be coming back as well. Uh, overall, a lot of attention on Cole Komet, and deservedly so, Tom. He's uh, he's really playing well right now, and not just in the passing game. He's got a different responsibility every week, but 18 targets, 16 catches. Uh, the touchdowns are up to, to six now, and uh, really playing some good football. Yeah, well, you know, at the podium today, Matt Eberflus complimented his downfield blocking. And I think that's a huge asset for the tight ends. And I think Robert Tunyon did some really nice things downfield in terms of a blocker. So if you can get multiple guys extending their responsibilities downfield, that helps guys like Darnell Mooney and DJ Moore get more after the catch. It helps the running game. And I I think it's a heck of a compliment because you expect good tight ends to catch the football. I think it's a compliment when you talk about tight ends being good blockers. And I think Cole Komet did a great job of selling the block at the line of scrimmage on his second touchdown because I think that was such a major influence that created him to be open as much as him just being a good receiver. Also love the touch. You got to give the touch to Bajan. Uh, some outstanding throws right there. Uh, take a chance. Download the Bet Rivers app today. Let's get the status from Hallis from head coach Matt Eberflus opportunities galore yesterday to win that game despite the turnovers. Is that the part that's both impressive 
at one point because the defense was pretty much faced with some really difficult field position starts or whatever. And then just, uh, again, just the whole missed opportunity thing because you're still right there. Yeah, I mean, for three quarters, you know, we did an excellent job. Um, There's some really good performances there all the way through the game, Yeah, of course. But, uh, you know, Cole Komet and, you know, the way the defense played and, and uh, certainly some great performances from the offensive line, you know, in the run game and the pass game. You know, Tevin played really well. So there are some great performances in there. And, uh, again, we got, you know, just the whole finish, you know, the whole finish. You know, going into the fourth quarter, um, you know, with obviously the takeaways there, the giveaways – and, uh, you know, the defense rose up to the occasion to give us a chance um, during those moments um, in the fourth quarter. But, again, those are things that win and lose football games. And that's where we got to learn, you know, and we got to make sure we're, we're going forward with the process of us getting better in that. And once we do that, like we, you know, like we've seen in the past, you know, those our game against you know, the Raiders and the games against the Washington, you know, we were plus two and plus three in the turnover margin. So those are always important factors. This is uh, enlightening to me. I talked to Eddie Jackson after the game, and he didn't even realize how many times that New Orleans were starting in plus territory. And that's the exact mindset. You, you can't. You can't, like, feel, oh, my gosh, how are we going to stop him? Right. And I just really feel the defense uh, in that fourth quarter, man. They really, really grinded. Yeah, you know, we have a, a motto, you know, it's, it's sudden change is what yeah. we call it, you know, and – and what we do is we all get together, right? And our message to them is, hey, we're going to go, you know, three and out, all right? And we're going to take the ball away. Or if they try to kick a field, we're going to block it. And that's that's our mindset. And that's how we got to be. And we so you actually talk to them on the sideline? You gather them after that? Gather okay, them, okay. Yep, gather them up. Because um, sudden change, make sure we're all together. And then we go out there and we take the field together and we understand what we're trying to do. Now, does it happen every single time? Uh, no, but uh, it happens yesterday. certainly happened a lot of time, you know, most of the time. And, uh, again, we've been good at that uh, before and we'll continue to be uh, solid at that. You know, you mentioned Tevin and, I, you know, watching the tape again and just even seeing the isolated highlights and the still shots that people may post. Man, he is killing people out there, finishing. Uh, yeah, he's, he's How important really is this right now with – that mindset and Darnell is the same way. Yeah, the style. You know, yeah. the style for us is so important. And, uh, you know, we have to do a good job of, of showing that every single time. You know, and, and I always remind the guys about, you know, before we go out on the field, about finish the way we finish. And that's an important piece of that. And Tevin does a heck of a job with that, being the example of how to finish off plays. Yeah, I think Pro Football Focus had him as the number one rated player offensive lineman in the league uh, this week. So you guys – Obviously, grade differently and, and yeah, so forth. Yeah, that's not but, surprising. That really isn't. He's yeah. been practicing well, and he's really been doing a nice job. All right, uh, Tyson Bajan, hot start. His first on first down, he was it was really successful early on in the game. Uh, the rushing and all, all those things, using Cole Komet these last two weeks, eighteen targets, sixteen catches, um, everything you'd like to see in, in a quarterback. Now, just value the ball, and but you know, Cole even mentioned in a post game interview with myself as well. Yeah, the. You can help them out a little bit, come back to the ball, right. fight it off. Well, the, it's a learning experience, yeah. right? And, uh, again, sometimes, you know, you, you have to learn through experience, obviously. That's how you do it. And, uh, you know, for three quarters, he had, what, 271 yards, you know, out of our 352, you know, and he had a passer rating of 123, you know, going into the fourth quarter. And to me, um, that that's a good performance, really good performance. And, uh, you know, the drive he had to start the game. We had other, also had a long drive at the end of the half uh, where we missed the field goal. That was a 16-play drive, I believe, or 13-16-play to 16 play drive. So he put some really good uh, uh, drives together out there, which was awesome, you know. How about the runs, though? Like the fourth and two, he, he could have thrown it, saw the green grass, took it, took what's there. The the 13-yard the run yeah, the third and the and 13. reach, yep. that, yep. that was – Yep. Yeah. So the so the man. go for it for in fourth and one there. That well, was a green light for us, and the play design was really good because we had a run pass option. had had uh, several things that we could do there. Um, you know, once he rolled out, and uh, made a great decision to run it. You know, he could have thrown it to DJ right away if he wanted to, yeah. but he decided to run it and uh, made it there. And then the third and thirteen, you know, the one we challenged. Um, well, thank re- goodness you challenged. <laughs> yep. yep. That was a tough spot. Right away. Yeah, so I, I knew it was a tough spot right there, you know, to start. But, uh, you know, however it came out, if they were going to move that up to inches, we were going. Now, if they were going to leave it at a yard, we were going to kick. Uh, but they ended up overturning it the first down. So we, that's why we were challenging. And, uh, you know, the, the league made a nice uh, ruling on that. 
the latest on Justin will be a day to day, and that's going to be the the call here on a short week. Um, would you frame it in any way as optimistic or just leave it where it is? I'm just going to leave it at day to day. You know, we got to see where it is. Um, again, once we we do our uh, you know evaluation um, today, and then we'll see where it goes. Uh, we know more on Wednesday. And let's talk uh, specifically about Darnell Mooney. Uh, he looked fast. He looked fast on that surface. Uh, I was happy for him. It's been probably a little bit of a struggle for him to uh, find his mojo this year, yep. uh, find his place. But uh, is that a good sign? Yeah, it really is. And, and I'm really happy for him because, you know, the targets that he had, you know, he's got, what, six targets and five receptions, excellent job, and a 16 average, you know. So, and not only catch the ball, you know, in the intermediate space, but also to catch those screens and to make those things, you know, really come alive. Uh, was really good to see. And then uh, about Cole Komet, just, uh, it's more than just what he's doing catching the football. He, you know, each week you don't know what he's going to wind up having to do more of, blocking or, you know, and uh, just two really good throws. But that first catch, that's in the magnificent category. Yeah, right? that's really one of, that's really honestly <laughs> one of the better plays I've seen over the last couple of years, uh, not only on our, on our football team, but on any football team. And, uh, and uh, he's really playing at a high level. Um, but again, the stuff you don't see is is the blocking and the and the finishing and and doing our style. And then in the locker room, what you don't see is the leadership, you know, and, and how his light shines, you know, through our f- whole football team with his energy and his passion for this football team. And uh, he's done a remarkable job. Uh, offensive line, the false starts you mentioned, you know, I think it's the most in the league. How how can that be trimmed down? Yeah, we just got to clean that up. You know, that's that's coaching, right? That's that's uh, that's players. Uh, that's focus. Um, we just got to clean that up in the second half of the season, right? So, you know, so we got to make sure we're on point um, doing that. And uh, and again, it's it's together. It's coaches and players together making sure that we clean those things up. All right, you want to talk about T.J. Edwards continues to impress. Uh, I thought he played uh, with a violent finish yesterday. The blitzing, he's I think he's really good at that. I mean, I I just making some. Really big plays yesterday as well to keep things. Uh, keep things same with Sanborn for that. Yeah, matter. yeah, really. Uh, both inside guys played well. Um, you know, TJ. You know, plays with great passion. He's a really instinctive player. You know, so he can beat you to the punch. You know, in terms of the, you know getting the offense. You know, behind in terms of the run game and the pass game. Um, he we love to send him on pressures. You know, he does a really good job with that because he's strong. Um, you know, you saw what he did. You know, a couple weeks ago at Minnesota, and you know, we're going to continue to do that. And then Jack coming in. You know, playing his old position at Mike and taking over for Maine for that for that game and um, did an excellent job. You know, he made a lot of nice plays in space, um, but just good space tackles um, on the running backs, um, which is something we needed to improve on from last week. Yeah, he just fires, man. He just takes the angle and the instincts and goes. Yeah. Yep. It. yep. It was uh, like Badger Heaven out there yesterday. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yes, it was. And Zach Bond on the other side uh, uh, for them as well, the former Wisconsin linebacker. All right, so uh, – this is always interesting when you face a guy that hired you in Indianapolis, it's the head coach in Carolina, and uh, you guys know each other better than anybody. I'm certain pretty pretty darn close uh, friends as well, uh, getting ready for a Carolina team. And, you know, the records at this point and all that, 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 that doesn't matter now. It's an eight-game season, and you try and get what you can and, and see where see where it lands. But what did he mean to you, and what's this mean to you to face him? Yeah, he, he's uh, just a great person. Uh, number one and and a really good coach and a really good leader Um, and uh, I learned a lot from him and uh, he's he's so impressive in terms of his leadership skills and and uh, being a player and also a coach uh, really gives him great perspective and it really helped me to understand more of the player perspective just the time that we spent together and I think it made me a better coach and it made uh, it's it's really helped me for this job and I really appreciate him for that and uh, so he's 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 a great person again um, this is a this is a challenge for both of us, right? You know, we got a uh, you know we got a good football team in front of us, and again, a lot of times the records don't show, uh, but they've been in a lot of tight games. Um, you know, so uh, it's going to be a big challenge for us. Uh, I know you probably haven't had a ton of time yet, but Bryce Young, what's he what's it look like to you? Yeah, there seems like a lot of poise. You know, a lot of poise out there. He knows where he's going with the ball. Um, he's got good pocket presence. Um, he's got a quick release, and uh, you know he's utilizing his skill. And I think he's done a good job of that. All right. And uh, I don't know who's going to play for them either because they have some concussions. But uh, Brian Burns, outstanding pass rusher. That would be a guy if he does play. you got to block. But other than that, uh, back home at Soldier Field, 
Go ahead and get one. Yep, looking forward to it. Thank you, man. All right. All right. Uh, you know, one of the things he, he was equally uh, impressed by that catch by Cole for the touchdown of the opening drive of the game. The way they move the ball, the, the creativity and the work by Bajent, you know, using his legs too. I mean, that that's somewhat of a surprise that he was able to pile up that kind of yards. And he had options. There was a run pass option there on on several of those plays that he ran, and he decided to go with the green grass or the turf well, that, in this case. Right. That touchdown catch, which was an incredible yeah. throw, and it was an equally incredible catch. And I was kind of hesitant after you called it a touchdown just to make sure that, like Matt Eberflu said, you have to take the violence of hitting the ground into, uh, you know, into concern when you have that type of catch. But, you know, one thing about Bajan, he had D.J. Moore open as well. And to pass up a guy as good as D.J. Moore to give Cole Komet an opposite field opportunity to make a touchdown catch, it was really gutsy. But I think when you put Cole on a 5'10 defensive back, the advantage goes to Cole all times. Or a 5'8 defensive back, <laughs> as it was with Tyron. 5'10", but, uh, you oh, know. that meant 5'8". That yeah. meant 5'8". Yes. That's my size. 5'7 and a half on a good as day. As long as you got your hair puffed up in the middle. 5'7 <laughs> and a half on a good day. Uh, Steinoffels is an employee-owned furniture and mattress store. Visit any of their four Chicagoland locations in Vernon Hills, Crystal Lake, Downers Grove, and Harwood Heights, or shop online at steinhoffels.com. I know you and I both are big fans of Darnell Mooney. We loved his attitude since he got here. Uh, former Tulane star back in Louisiana and uh, really had a nice game yesterday. Season high. Let's listen in to some of his reaction to the game and the uh, loss to the Saints. Uh, I mean, we got to see consistency with everything. So, I mean, I'm looking for those for for towards those opportunities and see if that if that was just a, a thing or what so. But like I said, it's about not just me. It's about DJ. It's about Cole. Get the ball in those in these playmakers' hands and let us make plays. So. And that, that shines good with the offense. Every time, you know, DJ has a big play, we end up scoring. Every time Cole has a big play, we end up scoring me, whatever. You just need sparks, whatever whatever drive. You need at least one or two sparks to go down and score. And we need those within those those guys that have playmakers. I mean, the playmakers to do those things within every series. Sorry, on the first and 10 play where Tyson checks the play at the line and then it ends up going to you behind the line of scrimmage. Uh, and then you, you got a first down on it. It was just a, a screen. Um, I guess he's seen some pressure and um, just, you know, usually when you have blitzes or whatever, um, the best thing is a screenplay. So uh, to take care of that. And I just had one on one with Tyran, kind of tried to make a miss, slipped it a little bit and then he uh, grabbed my foot. So I thought I was going to score. Um, and then I was getting stuff from Tevin the whole night after that play. So um, I definitely wanted to score. Even that one, the long, the long run, just feel like I could score every time. So. Sure. With it being Carolina week, it feels like a natural time to ask you about you know DJ and the impact. Yeah. What it, in these eight months? Something that made I mean, obviously the on-field impact and all that, but like what to you that we don't necessarily see every day has kind of highlights his impact on this team. Uh, I mean his his mindset of just coming in every day and like I mean he has the mindset of like give me the ball so I can make this make this work and. And it's like a, a domino effect with everybody. Like, okay, he has that confidence, and it's a reason why he has that confidence because he works at it. And, I mean, every time he, he gets the ball, he makes a play. So um, I would say within last year, um, to compare to this year with him not being on team and being here, it's like with me, I can say. Um, having that guy next to me and just knowing that, hey, it's another guy that's going to make some plays, like, hey, I got to make some plays too. So, And um, he's always going to be making those. So it definitely gives me the, the motivation to continue to try to make some plays. Well, you've been asking for it. Like, all right, who else other than DJ and Cole? You know, it's, it's nice to have other players getting targets and to make a defense beware of just more than two. Well, you know, the thing about it, you know, after that first catch, the 38-yarder that Darnell Mooney had, or the 38-yarder, it might have been a second catch, you and I looked at each other and we go, wow, he yeah. looked a lot more explosive than we've seen him. 
So you have to take everything into account. DJ, or, um, Darnell Mooney comes in motion opposite side of the field than where he started, made the catch at the line of scrimmage, exploded up field, three defenders in front of him. He stopped on a dime. They all overran the play, and then he continued to cut it up field. And then you look up field, and you get blocks by Cole Komet and Robert Tunyon up field. So the hustle of those guys downfield to really add an extra 10 yards to that catch, those are, uh, you know, a couple of the elements that impressed me the most. But when you talk about DJ, you talk about Darnell, and you talk about Cole Komet, if you put those three receivers at the line of scrimmage and now coverage has to be responsible for all of them, I think you have the opportunity to open up the running game even more. So I think all these different elements that are involved in the offense can work hand in hand to make the offense more explosive. The worst thing about losing and being a team that is in that category right now is the Bears are 2-7 and seven and you know really two years of losing is that you think you got something figured out in one vein and then another one pops. And now all of a sudden the penalties, the false starts, the pre-snap penalties, which are awful deadly, and the Bears have the most false start penalties in the NFL. Seven penalties on the offensive line, six were accepted yesterday. Uh, what is that a function of, in your opinion? I mean, the crowd, you, yes, you could say that. It's a road game. Uh, the Saints fans were, were thrilled to get the win. Uh, but what, what is the bigger picture issue with that one? Um, games on the road, multiple starting quarterbacks, an inconsistency in the rhythm of the snap count on a regularity. So the, the snap counts of the guys that I played with throughout my career, and you hear, you hear thousands of cadences from them, there's a consistency and you understand the timing and the rhythm of their count. Whether they go on first sound, go on one hut or on two huts, you understand that rhythm. So it's almost a pre-predictable um, uh, timing that you couldn't put in your mind to have, you know, it coincide with the way the, the quarterback calls the snap count. And so I think that's what you need. Oh, say, okay, we have 33 different offensive line starting combinations. They've gone through a couple different quarterbacks. Now there is no consistency in the rhythm of for anybody because no one's been in there for hundreds and thousands of snaps together. And so when you go about, uh, go out there and you break down every fall start let's talk about who they're against what atmosphere are they in and who's playing quarterback so the more you play together the more time you get behind center with the same quarterback the more into a rhythm that whole group will fall into that that rhythm and there will be more consistency in the rhythm of the get off which makes what Joshua Dobbs did in Minnesota remarkable uh, literally on the sideline before the game getting under center Garrett uh, Bradbury and just going through some of that right there on the sideline before the game uh, the calls the snap um, just amazing what he was able to do uh, with really no practice time with the Vikings and goes and gets a win but I guarantee you he probably went on the same snap count a majority of the time. Yeah. And then that's you finally you can it's a lot easier to fall into that rhythm than if you have a quarterback that has some experience in the deceptiveness of a snap count and they use multiple snap counts. Now it has to fall into the maturity of the offensive line to make sure they understand what the quarterback is saying. You know, Matt is is constantly talking about uh, takeaways and the need to get that turnover margin in your favor to get a win. That's the two wins they've had. They've had a plus turnover margin. Are you seeing reasons why they're not getting uh, takeaways on defense? They're doing a lot of things well. They're stopping the run. They're still stopping the run, uh, but they're just not getting the takeaways. They're certainly not getting the sacks. That's a whole other topic of conversation. But uh, what what can lead to getting more of that in your favor, contesting balls, getting 50-50 balls in your favor, punching the ball out. I mean, these guys are playing hard. They are. They're running to the ball. I mean, look at T.J. Edwards' play. I mean, I think he's playing outstanding right now. I mean, what's your thought? 
You know, I do think it's um, pressure uh, from the defensive lineman to put the quarterback in an uncomfortable throwing position, whereas it affects his accuracy, it affects his aiming point, or even the fact that it speeds up the process of the play and the defensive backs get a jump on the football rather than the receivers getting to their landmark. So it's a sped up process of football from the front that matches up to the back end of it. And again, you talk about a defensive backfield that has a rotation of players. It's a lot like the offensive line. And I think once the you settle on a group of guys that get a chance to play hundreds of snaps together along with the defensive line, I think they'll get a better understanding of how the back end can complement the front, the front end. You know, uh, let's take a sneak peek at the uh, Panthers as we get ready for this quick turnaround. Good news, Chicago. United Airlines is getting brand new planes with all the bells and whistles like Bluetooth connectivity, screens at every seat, and room for everyone's roller bag. United, proud to fly the Chicago Bears and you too. Every time I think of the Panthers, I think of one guy. And there's been plenty of great matchups between the Bears and Panthers in our time together. Uh, And that guy is Steve Smith Sr. (laughs) Now, it was the playoff uh-huh. game after the 05 season, so it actually was played in 06 over there at Soldier Field. You're, you remember that one? Oh, yeah. uh, Steve Smith went off. Like 218 yards in receiving, two touchdowns, and he was chirping the entire time. Remember he 11 catches? 12. You remember wow. what he did? He ran to the goalpost after catching a touchdown. He slid down the, the, the foam around the post yeah. with the Bears logo. But, you know, one of the funniest stories – in my opinion, anyway. So I covered the Super Bowl then after that, and he was at a bar at the Super Bowl headquarters. And I went up to him and said, hey, I'm the play-by-play announcer of the Bears. He goes, nice to meet you. I go, it was one of the most impressive performances I've seen in a long time. And I, I just want to say, you know, yeah, it hurt. But he goes, and I remember this, he says to me, yeah, I hear a lot of people are upset. I don't know what you're all upset about. You knew it was going to happen. And he turned around and kept drinking. I mean, He just had this unbelievable confidence. And, you know, they've had great players there, but that dude was the most confident, smallish size receiver, a terror with an attitude. Right. That's why he was that. That's why he was great. And that's why even when you watch him as a broadcaster, he continues to have that a little bit of arrogance in his attitude that filters into what he has to say. But, you know, the funny thing about it is now – uh, you know, ex- speeding up to today, and you think Adam Thielen is their their yeah. number one receiver that you know we're so familiar with in Minnesota, and he's got 15 more catches than DJ Moore, but he's got 125 less yards. Yeah. So yeah, and also okay. So you went from Steve Smith, uh, just a little or uh, smaller stud of a wide a guy, to Adam Thielen the most unlikely star caliber, uh, you know, career that's, you know, come at it at, you know, the way he tried out for Minnesota and he had the success there that he had. Right. Yeah. He is a great story. One of the best undrafted free agents around, uh, you know, we were talking on, on the team playing hey, Tariq Cohen's on the practice squad. And I thought oh, it'd be kind of cool if he was active for this game. You know what? He, he was just placed on a practice squad injured list because he, he had a hamstring issue this week. So, uh, it's derailed his comeback a little bit here. And, of course, uh, the poor guy has had a lot of setbacks. Injury-wise, certainly starting with that punt return in a bear uniform shortly after signing an extension. And uh, that injury turned out to be a very severe situation, then an Achilles. And uh, I always like Tariq. I love his attitude, thinking about a guy who's, uh, you know, barely 5'6", and came in here thinking he was going to, he was going to be the guy, and he he was. He was outstanding in the return game and a, an excitement waiting to happen. Yeah, I'm in his corner for sure. I, I cheer for Tariq Cohen. And, I you know, the thing about Tariq, what I remember, is the very first time you and I sat down and we did an appearance with him. And he was kind of shy and he was kind of reserved and he was a little introverted. And then maybe a year later, we did another one with him, and he was extroverted and outgoing and smiling and <laughs> funny. So I, I like to see his personality grow, um, and I, that's why I wish the best for him, and I, I hope that his comeback continues successfully. Bears, etc. are brought to you by PNC, official bank of the Bears. What do you take out of uh, a Frank Reich-Matt uh, Eberflus matchup 
Frank hired him to be his defensive coordinator in Indianapolis in 2018. They worked together those four years. He thinks a lot of him, so he knows Frank's offense. Frank knows his defense and how Matt thinks, and Matt knows how Frank thinks. Uh, what impact what, does that have on the final say here in this matchup? So what is Frank's offense? I mean, does he, he goes all the way back to the K-Gun offense in Buffalo, Jeff. So I think Frank Reich has more offense in his mind than a lot of offensive-minded coaches in the NFL that really never played the game because he has experience of – the of an offense in Buffalo that was as creative as any offense and successful offense run by Jim Kelly and his group of players. And Frank Reich had some success there too. So I think that Frank Reich has the ability to develop an offense with the experience of whichever quarterback he has right now. He has a super young inexperienced quarterback, even though he played at Alabama and the more time they can spend together, the more creative I think Frank Reich could be about his offensive philosophy. Bryce Young coming off three interceptions, two by one of Matt Eberflus's favorite players. Kenny Moore had two pick sixes on Sunday. So you had two rookie quarterbacks, one, the number one pick in the draft, and the undrafted pick out of Shepard, both with three interceptions. And I said this to Matt, as you heard in the interview, uh, no one wants to hear rookies throw interceptions. I mean, that's what happens. Right. Uh, they do, and uh, it's it's not the easiest of transitions. Some have made it look easy, but uh, it's it's not. And so it'll be an interesting matchup. Whomever quarterbacks for the Bears on Thursday night, um, I guess it's probably good news for the Bears that Brian Burns may not be able to play C.J. Henderson, uh, their corner, but Burns an outstanding pass rusher, Tommy. And and they're doing a nice job against the pass. Uh, that That is one area they're doing well defensively, and back to – Reich, he he wants to run the football. He says so. You know, they they need to establish the run. I, I think every offensive coach wants to have some establishment of the running game because that helps them throw the ball more effectively. Because if you run the ball, then you're suspicious every time they play action pass. And then once you start running play action pass successfully, it gives you downfield opportunities. So, you know, Frank Reich is always going to start with the foundation of running game and let the offense build from there. If it is Justin Fields, what would you like to see given the thumb? And I don't know, you know, if he plays, if he doesn't play, is it 100%? Is it not 100%? I mean, what what type of attack you'd like to see here? Would I be asking too much if I asked for a repeat of the Washington Commanders game? Because, you know, I think that still left an indelible mark on all of our heads because we didn't know if the Bears could go into Washington, face that defensive line, give him the proper protection, and then have a successful passing game to complement it. You remember Khalil Herbert got injured. Roshan Johnson got injured in that game. Kari Blassing game ended up being one of the main running backs. And then you got... Uh, Justin Fields throwing the ball to DJ every other play for a, hundreds of yards and, you know, touchdowns all over the field. Can you name the kicker for the Carolina Panthers? I cannot. Eddie Pinheiro. Oh, that's right. I knew that. <laughs> I knew that because they have former Bears special team coach. Uh, yes. Chris Tabor. Chris Tabor. Uh, everybody in this building love Chris Tabor, and uh, it would be good to say hello to him. But, yeah, Eddie's having a nice year uh, for the Carolina Panthers. Miller Lite, the official beer of the Chicago Bears. Tastes like Miller time, Chicago. All right, Tom, uh, that'll do it for us. I think uh, we did enough damage for a day on a short week. We got work to do, right? Oh, I'm just ready to roll. You're ready to roll. For Bears head coach Matt Eberflus and the man who likes to rock and roll, Tom Thayer. I'm Jeff Joniak. Thanks for listening, everybody. Our next Bears Etc. podcast coming up uh, after the game, I guess, on Friday against these Carolina Panthers. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe now on the Chicago Bears official app, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Bear down.